Hey guys, Laura here, founder of STP. I score a perfect 800 on the math. And in this video, I'm gonna walk you through the math modules from practice test six in Blue Book. This includes a harder second module. Just a heads up, there's many different ways to solve these problems. So if you end up solving a problem a different way than me, comment below, I would love to hear about it. I'm gonna to try to show you guys some tricks so you can get through the section as quickly as possible. I finish math sections with enough time to go back and redo every problem to check careless mistakes, and that's how I got a perfect 800. Just a heads up, we are giving away our math workbook free right now. If you subscribe to our email list, I would definitely go get that if you're prepping for math. I'll put the link up here right now. And of course, make sure you subscribe and like this video. All right, guys, let's get into it. We're on number one, module one. So it says a bird can fly at an average speed of 16 meters per second. At this rate, how many meters would a bird species fly in four seconds? Well, if it's 16 meters per second, it's gonna go 16 times four or 64. The other answers don't even make sense. If four seconds went by, it's gonna travel much farther than 16 meters. So you wouldn't wanna pick 20, 16, or 12. Number two, line R in the XY plane has a slope of four and passes through the point zero six. Obviously guys, that's the Y intercept or your B. So you're looking for a slope of four plus six, the answer is D. All right, which expression is equivalent? Well, I noticed that my lead term is a five X to the fifth. So D and C aren't gonna get me that when I multiply those together. So I'm looking for five X to the fifth and both A and B get that, but I know I need a middle term and A will only get me two terms. So I'm gonna go with B. All right, number four, we've got the equation X plus Y equals 1440. It represents the number of minutes of daylight. X and the number of minutes of non-daylight. Okay, so X is daylight, Y is non-daylight, and it says there's 670 minutes of daylight. So I'm gonna go ahead and substitute that in for X. They wanna know how much is non-daylight, so I will solve for Y. And I believe it's 770, but I would say, even if you're gonna do mental math, which is great, always check with the calculator because it's so easy to make a careless mistake and it is 770. Okay, all right, Scott selected 20 employees at random from all 400 employees at a company. He found that 16 of the employees in the sample are enrolled in exactly three professional development courses. Which of the following is the best estimate of the number of employees at the company who are enrolled in exactly three professional development courses? So I wanna know the total based off of the sample. So I'm looking for proportions. I know that if we got 20 out of the 400th, that's just 1 20th of the sample. So I multiply that number by 20 to get back to the total of 400 employees. So I'm gonna take the 16 that were enrolled in three professional courses and also multiply it by 20 to get to the total amount of people that are enrolled in three professional courses. And that would be 320. Obviously don't pick four, you guys, that's an outlier. Like look at all your answer choices. There's no way it's gonna be four. So just you know, keep that in mind. Okay, which has the same solution as the given equation? Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna distribute this out because I wanna see what it looks like. Because I know same solution means they would be infinite, so they're gonna be in proportion to each other. So if I end up dividing all of these terms by seven, another equation that's in proportion to this would be two X minus three equals nine. So I'm gonna pick A because that would make infinite solutions. All right, number seven, we've got the given equation relates to the positive numbers C, P, and K. Which equation correctly expresses C in terms of P and K? The, this is almost too easy. You just have to add seven to both sides to get C by itself. It's kind of weird. I don't know why they made that one so easy, but the answer is A. All right, we've got a function P estimates there were 2,000 animals. Okay, that would be the initial amount, so that would be out front. All of them have that. Each year from 98 to 2010, the function estimates that the number of animals increased by 3%. So that is the rate. It's a growth rate going up. We've got to add it to one. The only one that does that is C. You should have a 1.03 inside the parentheses. This would be a growth rate of 300%. This is a growth rate of 97%. Um, this is actually a, a decrease of 3%. So don't pick any of those. All right, which expression is equivalent to all of that? Now, listen, you could multiply this out and simplify, but let's just keep it simple. 
the constant in each equation, they're all different. I know I'm gonna get my constants by squaring the 11 and also multiplying the negative five and the five. So 11 squared is 121, and then negative five times five is negative 25. When I add those together, I get 96, so I know that the answer is B. All right, number 10, we've got an egg is thrown from a rooftop. The equation H equals negative 4.9 T squared plus 9T plus 18 represents this situation, where H is the height, T is the seconds. According to the equation, what is the height in meters from which the egg was thrown? Well, when the egg was thrown, T was zero seconds. So all you need to do is put in zero for T, so you're gonna have zero plus zero plus 18. So they started at a height of 18. You're just looking for the y-intercept there, guys, or the c value of the uh, equation. Okay, we have if four square root two x equals 16, what is the value of six x? Well, let's keep this simple. We can divide both sides by four. So now I have square root of two x equals four. I'm gonna square both sides. So now two x equals 16, divided by two, divided by two, x is eight. So 6x is going to be 48. The answer is B. Make sure you always read the question carefully because they're not always going to ask for X. They were actually nice that they didn't put 8 as an answer here. I'm really surprised. All right, number 12. The relationship between two variables, X and Y, is linear. For every increase in the value of X by 1, the value of Y increases by 8. Well, guys, remember with slope, it's a rise over run. So that means the slope is going to be 8 over 1. When the value of x is 2, the value of y is 18. Okay, so they gave us a set of coordinates, 2 comma 18. What expresses this relationship? I'm just going to use the point-slope formula. So we've got y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So I'm going to have y minus 18 equals 8 times x minus 2. And when I simplify that out and I add 18 to both sides, I get y equals 8x plus two, so the answer is C. All right, how many distinct real solutions does the given equation have? Well, I already know right away there's gonna be no distinct real solutions because if we square root both sides, you cannot do that. You can't square root a negative. It's imaginary, so you're gonna put zero. There's no real solutions to that. 14, if two box plots show the distribution of number of books read over the summer by the students in two different English classes, what is the positive difference between the ranges of numbers of books read over the summer for the two classes? Okay, so I'm looking at the range for class A, which is gonna be five minus zero, so the range is five. The range for class B is gonna be 10 minus one, so the range is nine. So I want the positive difference, so I'll do nine minus five, so the answer is four. All right, if this video is helpful so far, go ahead, hit that like button below, show me some love. Let's look at 15. The length of the edge of the base of a right square prism is six units. The volume of the prism is 2,880 cubic units. Just a heads up, you guys, if it's a right square prism, that means just the base is gonna be a square of six by six, and then the height is gonna be different. They didn't say it's a cube, so now all the sides are the same. So that's what we're trying to figure out is the height. So basically, we've got six squared times h, that's gonna equal 2880. Let's divide both sides by 36, because that's what six squared is. When I go ahead and pop that in the calculator, I get 80, so h is 80. Okay, so it says a scatter plot shows a relationship between two variables, x and y. An equation for the exponential model shown can be written as y equals a times b to the x, where a and b are positive constants. Which of the following is closest to the value of b? Well, listen, if they're both positive and that graph is going down the way that it is, this is going to be an exponential decay, not an exponential growth. So I need a decay rate in there. This is losing 17%, so I'm going to pick A. The other ones are gaining. D is gaining a lot. That would really shoot up, so definitely not pick D. All right, number 17, what's the value of cosine of x? Basic, basic, you're going from this angle. We want adjacent over hypotenuse, so it will be 11 over 28. You have exactly five spaces to fill things in, so you can fit that perfectly as a fraction. One, one, slash, two, eight. What is the positive solution to the given equation? Well, those are all the factors of it, so I know that there's a solution at negative two, a solution at five and a solution at negative nine. They want the positive one, so it's gonna be a positive five. When you get factors, change the signs to get the solutions. All right, they said YQ is 63, and they said WQ is 70. 
and then they said WX is 60 and XQ is 120. Now I can already tell you guys that these are similar triangles because those are vertical angles and these are both equal to A degrees. So that means all the angles are equal so they're similar and they're proportional in nature. So when I look at this side and this side, those correspond with each other. So I'm going to go, and by the way, they wanted YZ. So I'm going to go small to big. The 63 corresponds with the 70. And then I'm going to go small to big. The X corresponds with the 60. And then I'm going to do a little cross multiplication. And then I'm going to divide. Now you can set up your proportion differently than I did and you can still arrive at the right answer, just a heads up. The most important thing is you wanna make sure you get 54. And when you get 54, take a step back and ask yourself, does that make sense? You know, that triangle is slightly smaller than the other one. So yeah, 54 makes sense. It's slightly smaller than 60, you can move on. We've got the function G is defined by G of X equals X plus 14 times T minus X, where T is a constant. And the xy plane, the graph of y equals g of x, passes through the point 24, 0. What is the value of g of 0? Well, first of all, I know that this is a quadratic, guys, so it's going to graph like a parabola. There's a solution at negative 14, so it's going to cross over here. And then if it crosses through the point 24, 0, that's way over here. Okay? So 24, 0, we've got negative 14, 0. And it's going to go just like this through this guy, both of those guys. So anyways, that being said, if it passes through the point 24, 0, and they want to know um, G of 0, basically they want to know, well, what's the value of Y when X is 0, okay? Which is going to be like right here somewhere. So what we're going to do is, we're going to go ahead and we're going to put 24 in for T because that's the other solution because we have X plus 14 and really it should be written like this X minus 24. However, do you see guys how they switched it? This is where this one's so sneaky. They took the constant and they switched it with the X. So it's subtracting X, which is so annoying. So really we've got to rewrite that second part or we're going to get this thing wrong as 24 minus X, okay? And then if they want G of zero, you go ahead and put zero in for X to see what you would get for Y. So you're going to have 14 times 24, which is 336, okay? If you put that 24 in the wrong spot, if you put it in for X instead of T, you're gonna be in trouble. You'll get a negative 336 and that's wrong. So be mindful, you don't put the numbers into the X's, you put the numbers in next to the X, okay? All right, number 21, the number of zebras in a population in 2018 was 1.27 times the number of zebras in this population in 2014. If the number of zebras in the population in 2014 is P percent of the number of zebras in the population in 2018, what is the value of P to the nearest whole number? Okay, whenever I'm on a problem dealing with percents, I like to make up numbers. It's called nice numbers. It's a strategy. So I would just say like my initial amount in 2014 will have it be 100 zebras. So that means in 2018, it's gonna be 127 zebras if it's 1.27 times greater. So they said, um, if the number of zebras in the population 2014 is P% of the number of zebras in 2018. Okay, so now I'm gonna set up a proportion. We've got 2014 is to 2018. What is the percent? Okay, so I can cross multiply. I've got four zeros. And then I'm going to divide by 127. So it's going to be 78.74%, which they want the nearest whole number. So we got to write 79% or 79. Make sure you read carefully because you can literally fill in 78.74. You will get that wrong. They wanted the nearest whole number. So always go back and read the question. All right, last one for module one, number 22. Circle A is defined by the equation x plus two squared plus y squared equals nine. Okay, that means the radius is three. 
and that means the center is at negative two, zero, and that looks right. We have circle B is the result of shifting circle A down six units and increasing the radius so that the radius of circle B is two times the radius of circle A. Okay, so for circle B, we're gonna have a new center. So we've got x plus two squared. It's gonna affect the y. If it's going down six units, change the sign in the parentheses so it'll be y plus six squared. And our radius, if we're doubling it, now it's six. So we've gotta square that so it'll be equal to 36. It looks like the answer is A. All right, that's it for module one. If you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit the subscribe button and notification bell below so that you can get the best score possible on your next SAT. All right, guys, now we're moving into module two, and this is where the rubber meets the road. You gotta be more diligent, more careful, and this is when you're gonna use the tool Desmos. Notice how in module one, I didn't need to use Desmos at all. A lot of it was pretty simple mental math. But in module two, that's when this calculator is gonna be key and we're gonna use it about 30 to 40% of the time on this section and you'll see when I like to use it. So let's look at number one. We have a manager is responsible for ordering supplies for a shaved ice shop. The shop's inventory starts with 4,500 paper cups and the manager estimates that 70 of these paper cups are used each day. Okay, that sounds like it's a constant rate of change. So that is linear. So I'm gonna have my equation be y equals um, 4,500. That's the initial amount they're starting with and they're losing 70 cups per day. Based on the estimate and how many days will the supply of paper cups reach 1,700? Well, now I'm gonna put in 1,700 for y and I'm gonna solve for x. I'm gonna put 1700 in for y, and I'm gonna solve for x. Okay, 1700 minus 4500 Notice how I'm writing out all my work. I mean, listen, you have calculators and stuff, but write out your work just to be safe because if you don't show the steps on both sides, if you don't do the divide by negative 70, divide by negative 70, minus 4,500, minus 4,500, I've seen so many students make careless mistakes, you guys. It will happen to you. So be diligent, be thorough, be meticulous, write out your steps, even if you are like uh, amazing, like ninja at math. I still want you to write out your work. And the answer is B. All right, guys, we've got in triangle RST, the measure of angle R is 63 degrees. Which of the following could be the measure in degrees of angle S? Well, a triangle adds to 180 degrees. So we can't have the two angles add to more than 180. And we have to keep in mind there's a third angle that we need to factor in. So obviously S can't be 180 because that would never work. 126 and 63 is over 180 and so is 118. I mean, logically, I wouldn't even add these in the calculator. I would just know I've got to go with the smallest number possible because they said what could be the measure. And again, we need room to throw in a third angle. So I already know what College Board is doing here. They're giving me three that are too big. Got number three. So for which of the following tables are all the values of X and their corresponding values of Y solutions to the given inequality. This is the first time I'm gonna whip out Desmos. I think it's a lot faster and more efficient to do it this way. So let me go ahead and pull that up. I'm gonna type in my inequality. So it's y is greater than whoop, 4x plus eight. And then what I'm gonna do is I am going to put in those sets of coordinates in A and see if they all fit in there. So two comma 19, um, there was four comma 30, and then there was six comma 41. And when I go ahead and zoom out, as you can see, all of those dots guys are in the solution. So that was easy peasy. The answer is A and we can just move on. Number four, the function F is defined by F of X equals nine sevenths X plus eight sevenths. For what value of X does F of X equal five? Well, this is a simple equation. I'm just gonna set it up. I'll replace f of x with five. And I'm gonna solve for x. I don't like the fraction, so I'll multiply this whole thing by seven to get rid of the sevens on the bottom. And then at this point, I'm just gonna solve for x. So 
So it looks like X equals three. All right, number five, during a portion of a flight, a small airplane's cruising speed varied between 150 miles per hour and 170 miles per hour. Which inequality best represents this situation where S is the cruising speed? Where there is a range, it's between 150 and 170, so the only one that makes sense is D. That seemed oddly easy. Number six, the graph models the number of active projects the company was working on X months after the end of November 2022. Okay, so that means right here, that's where it starts. That's November 2022. According to the model, what is the predicted number of active projects the company was working on at the end of November 2012? Oops, I put 2022. I meant 2012. Okay, so we're just going to look at the initial value. It's five because that's when it started. All right, number seven, in the linear function h, h of 28 equals 15 and h of 26 equals 22, which equation defines h? Okay, there's a couple things I need to get a line. I need the slope and I need the y-intercept. So basically, they gave us two points. So I'm going to find the rise and the run here. So it looks like it's rising seven and it's running negative two. So my slope is negative seven halves. So I'm gonna cross off A and B. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find the Y intercept. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna plug in Y equals negative seven halves X um, and then plus B. Now I can pick either point to plug in. So I'm gonna use the 26 and the 22. So I've got 22 equals negative seven halves times 26 plus B. And then I'm gonna go ahead and solve for B. So I've got negative or seven times 13, that's gonna be a negative 91. I can already tell if I have a negative 91 on that side and I add it over, it's gonna be a big B or a big Y intercept. It won't be 23. I'm gonna go with 113 and move on. All right, we've got number eight. The table shows the linear relationship between the number of cars C on a commuter train and the maximum number of passengers and crew P that the train can carry. Which equation represents the linear relationship between C and P? Well, cars really is X and um, passengers and crew really is Y. So I'm gonna basically rewrite these guys. So like this would be 55X minus Y equals negative nine. Okay, what I wanna do next since it's in a table is I wanna figure out the slope, right? We need the slope, we need the Y intercept. So the rise going from 174 to 284, that's 110 and the run goes up two. So 110 over two is 55. So I do need a slope of 55. So we want a 55 in front of the X. Both of these guys give me a 55 in front of the X. These are in front of the Y, C and D. So we don't want those, okay? Now the next thing we need to figure out is what would be, I guess, like a, a Y intercept that would make sense. Now, remember guys, in point slope form, you want Y by itself on one side. So if we rewrote this and rearranged everything in A, we would add Y to the other side, and then we would basically add nine over to the other side. So I would have Y equals 55X plus nine, which makes sense. This one, if you rewrote it, it'd be Y equals 55X minus nine. Can you start with negative cars? because, or even negative passengers, I mean, whatever that number represents, I know we cannot have negative cars or negative passengers. So at that point, I don't need to try to find the y-intercept. I can just use some common sense and I'm gonna go with A. All right, number nine, which of the following is a solution to the given equation? Okay, so I've got a quadratic and it looks like based on all the answers, they use the quadratic formula, which is negative B, plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Make sure you know that formula. By the way, in our Preply app, which you can get on your phones, like if you have iOS or if you have an Android, we have math flashcards. So we put all of the important concepts you need to know for the SAT on there. The quadratic formula is a math flashcard. And um, when you have the app, you basically can add the flashcards to a study pile so you can keep studying them over and over, the ones that you don't know. So check that out if you don't have the Preply app yet. Um, it is amazing, it's helping so many students. I'll link up here so you can go get that right now. Let's get back to this problem though. We have, uh, what's a solution? So okay, so I know that um, the number out front 
is going to be negative b over 2a, which is really going to be a negative 12 over 2 or a negative 6. So I need a negative 6 out front. So none of the other ones are going to work. So I'm going to go with d. All right, that's it. <laughs> you don't have to crunch the whole thing out. It's like that other problem I did on module one where I just looked for the constants at the end. Isolate one part of it and then go from there. All right. What is the y-coordinate of the y-intercept of the graph of 3x over 7 equals negative 5y over 9 plus 21? I'm going to throw this in Desmos. I don't feel like doing math on this. This is going to be much easier for me. So let's go ahead. Let's pull up the Desmos again. Okay, so I have 3x over 7. And then I have equals negative 5y over 9. And then that's plus 21. Okay, cool. So they wanted the y coordinate of the y intercept. So the y intercept's right there. It's going to be 37.8. Easy peasy. Sometimes, as you guys can see, Desmos is so much better. All right, with number 11, it says, what system of linear equations is represented by the line shown? I'm going to go back and I'm going to use Desmos again because they're systems. So I feel like it'll be a lot easier. And actually, because that one answer choice was A when I used Desmos and I got it right away, I have a weird feeling they're going to bury the right answer at the bottom because it's going to take a while to get through all these. So I'm going to start with D and work my way up. So let's go ahead, let's type that into Desmos. I just know how College Board operates. I've been doing these tests for so long and they're sneaky. They want you to run out of time. So I'm gonna put 4x plus 10y equals 32. And then I'm gonna put negative 8x um, minus 10y equals negative 64. Let's zoom out. Oh my gosh, that's exactly the graph. That's perfect. They could hit right there at eight. They look the same as the picture. When you put in the other three, if you like flag the question to go back to, and then you want to put in the other three um, systems, you'll notice they look nothing like it. You'll definitely know that the answer is D. All right, we've got the solution to the given system of equations is X comma Y. What is the value of six times X minus two? Okay, listen, a lot of the times they treat binomials like just its own variable. So just don't get like all bent out of shape or confused about this. You've got a negative 4y plus 7 and a plus 4y plus 7. Those cancel out. If I have negative 4 of them and 4 of them, they go away. I have 2 times x minus 2 now because I've got 1 here and 1 here when I add those together. And then I'm going to go ahead and add my constants together on the other side. So I just use the elimination method because I could see that the two terms in the middle would cancel each other out. So now I've got 559. But the thing is, they want x minus 2 times 6. So I'm going to multiply both sides times 3. So that 6, x minus 2 equals 1677. All right, 13, what is the minimum value of the given function, which basically means it's the y coordinate of the vertex. So I'm gonna use Desmos and put that back in. So I've got y equals x squared minus 48x plus 2304. Let's zoom out and find this thing. 2304 is very, very high up. There it is, you just had to go up a lot higher. So it looks like the vertex is at 1728. Awesome. All right, how many solutions does a given equation have? Well, let's combine like terms. So I'm going to add 98x to both sides. So, and honestly, you don't need to do this, but I just want you guys to see why. Um, so I end up with 49x equals 0. Well, when I divide both sides by 49, I get x is 0. So there is one solution at x is 0. But if you just take a step back and look at those, you could know already that if you put in zero on both sides for x, they'll equal each other. So you might not need to do any math on that one. All right, the function g is defined by g of x equals x times x minus 2 times x plus 6 squared. The value of g7 minus w is 0, where w is a constant. What is the sum of the all, all possible values of w? Okay. So basically, what I know from what they gave me with g of x is there's a solution at 0, there's a solution at 2, and there's a solution at negative 6. 
So basically, they want to know where all the solutions are at. They're saying 7 minus w equals 0. Well, when the, when the polynomial equals 0 and y is 0, you're on the x-axis. That's where the solutions are. So that means I'm going to set 7 minus w equal to 0, 7 minus w equal to 2, and 7 minus w equal to negative 6. And I'm going to solve for w because they said, what's the sum of all possible values of w? So in that case, w is going to be 7. In this case, w is going to be 5, because then you have to like divide both sides by negative 1. In this case, w is going to be 13. So when we go and add all these together, we get 25. The biggest thing is, and this is where I see students messing up, don't forget about that term out front. If you see an x all the way in the front, that means there's a solution at 0. It's very easy to ignore that one and just think there's solutions at 2 and negative 6. So watch for that. All right, we have a grove has six rows of birch trees and five rows of maple trees. You know what? Like, I'm already seeing lots of words and lots of numbers. This is a type of problem where I'd want to go right to the question first to see what it's asking, because then it would be easier for me to go from there and reverse engineer the problem. So we've got what is the probability of selecting a maple tree given that the tree is 20 feet or taller? Okay, so I need basically my denominator to be all 20 feet or taller trees. And then on top, it's got to be a 20 foot or taller maple. Okay, so let's find out how many are 20 feet or taller. So they said um, there's six rows of birch trees, and each row of birch trees has eight trees 20 feet or taller. So if there's six rows and there's eight that are 20 feet or taller, there's 48 birch trees that are 20 feet or taller. And then it says we've got each row of maple trees. Oh, how many rows are there? There's five rows of maple trees, and each row of maple trees has nine trees 20 feet or taller. So we're going to have five times nine. So there's 45 maples. They're 20 feet or taller. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add those two together, which is basically 45 plus 48. And on top, I just want to put the maples, which is 45. So when I go ahead and simplify that, I have 45 over 93. And I know that those are divisible by 3 because 4 plus 5 is 9, and 9 is divisible by 3. And 9 plus 3 is 12, and 12 is divisible by 3. And when I divide by 3, I reduce it down to 15 31sts. All right. You could use your graphing calculator to reduce that fraction down too. All right, number 17. A rectangle is inscribed in a circle such that the vertex of the rectangle lies on the circumference of the circle. OK. Draw a picture. I'm going to draw one right now. Okay, cool. All right, it says the diagonal of each rectangle is twice the length of the shortest side of the rectangle. Okay, here's a diagonal. So I'll call that 2x, and I'm going to call the short side x. It says the area of the rectangle is 1,089 square root of 3 square units. Okay, well, why? Why is the area of the rectangle that? Well, when I see a square root of 3, I'm thinking, okay, it's a special right triangle. It's a 30, 60, 90. So somehow in here, we're, get, we're getting a 30, 60, 90. Oh, and the ratios are 30, 60, 90. Because if this is the x and this is the 2x, that means this side's going to be an x radical 3. You can see it right from your reference table. So that makes sense because then an area of a rectangle is base times height. So we're going to have the area equals base time, or the base is really x radical 3 times height. So 1089 rad 3 is x squared rad 3. Let's divide both sides by rad 3. So 1089 equals x squared. Now I'm going to square root it. If that's a perfect square, I'll be surprised. I didn't know that 1089 would be a perfect square. Hang on a sec. Yes, oh my gosh, it is a perfect square. Who would have thought? So x is 33, but they want the length of the diameter, okay? Remember, the diameter is 2x. If you're going from one point on the circle all the way to the other side, so the diameter is going to be 66. So just be careful. All right, 18, the positive number a is 2,241% of the sum of the positive numbers b and c. I'm going to make an equation out of that. So we have a is 
2,241% written as a decimal is 22.41. Of means multiply the sum of B and C. Okay, B is 83% of C. What percent of B is A? Okay. Because they're asking about B and A, that means we need to eliminate C. C is doing us no good. So I'm actually gonna solve for C so I can define C in terms of B. So it looks like C is B divided by 0.83. So now I'll substitute that into the other equation. So I have B plus B over 0.83. And what I'll do now is I'll distribute. So I have 22.41 B plus, now what's 22.41 divided by 0.83? Okay, that'd be 27, so plus 27B. So then when I add those together, I have A equals 49.41B. So that means it's 4,941%. 4, what percent of B is A? A is 4,941% of B, so the answer is D. Because remember, that's in decimal form, so you have to convert it back to a percent. All right, 19. In the given system of equations, P is a constant. If the system has no solution, what is the value of P? Okay, perfect time to use Desmos again. We've got a system of equations, and I also see it says P is a constant, which means I'm gonna set a slider for P and move that other graph around till there's no solution. They're both linear, so for them to be no solution, I want them to be parallel lines that never touch. So let's go ahead and let's put that into Desmos. Okay. Now I was way up high for that last problem, so I'm gonna come back down. Okay, right now they're crossing. I want no solution, so I need to move that slider for P until they're perfect, perfectly parallel. Okay. Oop, looks like I had it at 3.5. Let's do that again. I'm gonna zoom in though. You wanna get real close just to make sure that they're not touching. And as you can see, 3.5, they're perfectly parallel. So there's our answer. All right, we're on number 20, three more left, woo! Make sure you like this video, I'm like, I don't know guys, I'm getting tired. You know, this is a lot of work talking so much and making this video, but I hope you're finding it helpful. So let's look at 20. We've got the table shows three values of X and their corresponding values of G of X, where G of X equals F of X over X plus three, and F is a linear function. What is the Y intercept of the graph of Y equals F of X in the XY plane? All right, guys, this is just my opinion, but I think that this was the hardest question of the math on this test. And I would love to hear what you thought. So comment below and tell me what you thought the hardest question was on this test. But if you know what you're doing and you know how to use Desmos and you can do a regression, this problem becomes pretty easy. So let me walk you through how to do it. We're gonna use Desmos. All right, first off, they gave us a table. So I am going to recreate the table and type in the values. So hit the plus sign, hit table. Okay, our first x value was negative 27, and the first y value was three. And then we have negative nine and zero, and then we have 21 and five. Okay, great, table is done. Now, I'm gonna set up that equation that they gave me, the g of x equals f of x over x plus three as a regression. Now to do that, you don't, you can't use X and Y, all right? So you have to use like X1 and Y1, otherwise it won't work. And I'm gonna replace the G of X, the function with just a Y1 to keep it simple. So I'm gonna go ahead and put Y1. And instead of an equal sign, you gotta do a tilde. So I'm gonna do Y1 equals like that. And then I'm gonna do F of X1 divided by X plus three. Oh and I gotta do x1, you can't do an x, because those are already taken. All right, so they told us that f of x, we haven't defined it yet, they said it's linear. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna type in the next line, f of x equals mx plus b, okay? 
check it out you guys let me i don't know if i can zoom in on this they told us what the y-intercept is it's all done for us b equals 36 that's it so now all you have to do is pick 36 and then you can go home and feel great about your test and brag to all your friends about what you did all right we got two more all right we have a circle has center g and points m and n lie on the circle Line segment MH and NH are tangent to the circle at points M and N respectively. I have noticed that they're making harder geometry questions and not giving a diagram, so it's difficult to draw them. You have to be very careful. So take it one step at a time. I'm gonna draw a circle with a center G. Again, I can't draw circles, I'm trying. And then I'm going to put points M and N on the circle. Now, I'm going to have H out here because it's going to be those lines, M, H, are going to be tangent to the circle, meaning they only touch at that one point. All right. And then they said the radius is 168 millimeters. So just a heads up, you guys, from G to M, that's a radius, right? And from G to N, that's a radius. So that would be 168, and that's 168. Okay, now they want to know what's the distance between G and H. Well, heads up, if MH and NH are tangent to the circle, these are going to be right angles. So we've got two right triangles, basically. And... Um, at this point, we just need to figure out how to use the perimeter. So HN and MN are going to be equal to each other, okay? So if we have a perimeter of 3856 and we subtract 168 times 2, that's 336. What do we have left? 3520. Let's divide that by 2 so that we can get MH and HN. So each one of those is 1760. All right, well, now it's just a simple a squared plus b squared equals c squared where we're trying to get c. And since the leg, the biggest leg is 1760 and then c is the hypotenuse, we know we, the, that c is going to be bigger than 1760 because that's a leg. So get rid of that, that, and that. You have to pick d. Just logically, you don't need to crunch any more numbers. All right, guys, the last one, we're almost there. So we've got the function f is defined by f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, and c are constants. The graph of y equals f of x in the xy plane passes through the points 7, 0, and negative 3, 0. If a is an integer greater than 1, what of the following could be the values of a plus b? Well, first, I am going to basically rewrite that second thing that they gave us as an equation, okay? Because if they gave the solutions, I know that as an equation, it's going to look like this, x minus 7 times x plus 3. Those are the factors, okay? So they said a is greater than 1. So basically, this is an equivalent expression to that in standard form. Let's use Desmos and type them in and mess with b or a, their constants, and let's see if we can figure out what could be the value of a plus b. So I'm gonna go ahead into Desmos. As you can see, when the problem started to get harder and I got further into module two, I started to use Desmos more and more, right? So let me type in that equation. I've got y equals, now what I'm gonna do, they said a is an integer greater than one. So I'm just going to use the next best thing to keep it simple. I'm going to pick the next integer greater than 1. I'm going to pick 2. So I'll go ahead. I'm going to put 2 in for a. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to also write it in standard form. So 2ax squared. Um, oops, not 2ax squared. 2 is a. 2x squared um, plus bx plus c. I'll add sliders for b and c. Now, if they're equivalent expressions, I want those graphs to overlap where one's right on top of the other. So let me zoom out here. I don't even know where I am. Oh, there I am. Okay, here's our two graphs, right? So I want to see what the B value needs to be for those to overlap. Now, as you can see, it moves this way and this way. 
So it's going to be about there. And then I can move the C down so that they touch each other. So I'm going to actually change the interval of C. And I'm going to keep moving that down. And then it looks like we just have to move the B slightly. Look at that. So B is negative eight when A is two. What is the right answer then? Well, it could be negative six because they wanted to know what's the value of A plus B. So when A is, when A is two, B is um, negative eight. So that's a possible value. You would get negative three if you had A, B, one. But you need to read carefully. It says a is an integer greater than one. So you will not get negative three if you do any numbers bigger than one. All right, guys, that's it for this video. Just a heads up, it's strategic test prep. We have tutoring, we've got self-paced courses, we've got an app, like we've got all these things that can help you improve. So if you're interested in learning more about that, head to our website right now. And until next time, guys, happy prepping.